This is a version of a talk I delivered at the 2025 ASRA Spring Meeting as part of a debate on the preferred regional anesthesia technique for thoracic surgery. I was matched up against these two gurus of regional anesthesia, and as I said then, I felt like that proverbial guy who's brought a knife to a gunfight. But I want to start by putting to rest the debate around the mechanism of action of the ESP block. Now, we didn't completely understand this when we first described it in 2016, and this was picked on by the detractors of the technique. Although personally, I don't think that ignorance of how something works is a logical reason to say that it doesn't work. It's now clear from the best and most recent anatomical and imaging studies, especially in actual human subjects, not cadavers, that the primary mechanism of action is achieved through physical spread of local anesthetic to relevant neural targets. Is there a systemic effect from the local anesthetic? Maybe, but it's unlikely to be the main contributor. And in that respect, the ESP block is no different from any fascial plane block where we're injecting large volumes of local anesthetic. What's more important to realize is that this is an indirect block or a block by proxy. We're not trying to put our needle next to target nerves, but a distance away from them, primarily for reasons of increased safety. And then we rely on physical spread of the injectate to reach the nerves of interest. And there are actually many examples of established regional anesthesia techniques like this, such as the fascia iliaca block, which is really a lumbar plexus or femoral nerve block by proxy. And yet these don't generate the same controversy or debate. Think about that for a second. Now the thing about all blocks by proxy is that they won't produce conduction block of the same intensity as a direct block that is depositing right around the nerve. For the simple reason that a smaller fraction of the injected volume and thus less mass of local anesthetic reaches and acts on the target nerves. So even in ideal circumstances, an ESP block will not produce a block of the ventral rami and intercostal nerves that is equivalent to that of a paravertebral, and it shouldn't be expected to. The reduced intensity of conduction blockade also explains the other phenomenon observed with the ESP blocks, patchy and inconsistent loss of skin sensation. And this is again re often raised as an argument against the ESP block. Yet, meaningful analgesia can clearly exist despite the absence of cutaneous anesthesia. Once again, the explanation is simple. The less mass of drug that's available to act on nerves, the less complete the conduction block of the different nerve fiber types. Furthermore, it's been clearly shown that pain sensation is the most sensitive to blockade. And the ability to selectively block pain perception has been demonstrated, as you see here, in so-called selective spinal anesthesia with very low doses of lidocaine. And in epidural analgesia, it's the key to modern labor epidurals which use extremely dilute local anesthetic solutions to provide analgesia without excessive sympathetic motor or dense sensory block. And thus, differential blockade is a well-established clinical phenomenon, and it isn't unique to the ESP block. Furthermore, we see this discrepancy between clinical analgesia and detectable cutaneous sensory block with other fascial plane blocks, including the TAP block and the QL block. Yet we don't see the same argument going on about their utility, and I dare say many of you perform these blocks in your own clinical practice. So if the ESP block produces less intense neural blockade, why choose to do it? For the same reasons that we choose to do any other block by proxy. It's safer and lower risk because we keep the needle tip away from critical structures. It's also simpler, easier to learn and master, and thus more accessible to a wider range of practitioners. Not all of us can be Manoj Kamaka or Steve Coppins, much as we would like to be. And most importantly though, we choose blocks by proxy because they produce meaningful analgesia that's good enough in the real world. And in the real world, nothing's perfect, not even paravertebrals. I want to thank Dr. Kamarka for calling my attention to this Brazilian study which he cites in support of his article debunking the utility of the ESP block. It compared preoperative ESP and paravertebral catheters both using identical dosing regimens. The surgery was mostly VATs, but about 20% were thoracotomies in both groups. Now, this study was stopped early after enrolling only half of their planned sample size, 
and they concluded that the ESP block did not meet criteria for non-inferiority as they defined it. But let's look beyond the headlines. If we examine the data and the figures, we see that even in the paravertebral group, the white bars, the majority of patients are reporting significant pain on arrival in PACU, when we would be expecting the blocks to have the maximum effect. So that difference in intensity that should theoretically have been obtained with the paravertebral isn't really showing up in practice. The pain intensity metrics over 24 hours continue to show that a good number of paravertebral patients still have significant pain, albeit less so than the ESP patients. And the question we need to ask ourselves is this, how clinically meaningful is it? Especially when we see that by 24 hours, the pain curves for both groups have converged and crossed over. Same story with opiate consumption. The 24-hour difference is marginal, I would argue, especially when you consider the lower limit of the calculated 95% confidence interval is as little as 0.05 milligrams of IV morphine in the 24 hours. And most importantly, when we look at patient-centered outcomes, in this case satisfaction, we see identical curves. Patients are equally happy with the experience offered by the ESP block. And the practitioners are also happier. Paravertebral blocks and catheter insertion were rated as almost twice as difficult to perform. So we're back to the question of what can you do safely and easily for your patient that keeps them comfortable enough? And that is one issue with a lot of literature around regional anesthesia an overemphasis on pain scores and opiate consumption. The whole point of regional anesthesia and acute pain medicine is to enhance surgical recovery. And pain scores and opiate use are just one part of the overall picture. More holistic measures like patient satisfaction and quality of recovery scores may be more appropriate measures of the value of our interventions. And this next study from an Irish group illustrates this well. They compared ESP catheters placed by anesthesiologists with paravertebral catheters inserted percutaneously by the surgeon with video assistance to confirm correct placement. Both groups again received the same dosing regimens maintained for 48 hours. What they found was that the ESP group had significantly higher quality of recovery scores at 24 and 48 hours, with the differences exceeding the threshold for minimum clinically important differences. What's more interesting was that this difference wasn't explained by dramatically better analgesia. In fact, pain scores and opiate consumption were similar between the ESP and paravertebral groups. Instead, patients in the ESP group were less anxious, less sad, had better sleep, felt more rested, and reported better general well-being at 24 hours. At 48 hours, the significant differences in favor of the ESP group were in regards to absence of severe pain and being better able to care for themselves. To be fair though, I can just as easily pull up a study of ESP blocks that fails to show any improvement in quality of recovery scores 24 hours after VATS, like this one from Clybert and Al in Vancouver. But the important distinction to note is that unlike the Irish study, they were evaluating single-shot blocks, not catheters. Now, the block worked compared to placebo as shown by lower pain scores in PACU and a shorter duration of the PACU stay. However, if we consider that the duration of most fascial pain blocks is about 8 to 12 hours on average, it's not surprising and perhaps even expected that any impact on outcomes that are measured at 24 hours or beyond is going to be muted. So as we weigh the available evidence for benefit, one of the main things we must consider is if we are appropriately matching time frames for block duration and outcome assessment. So when it comes to the efficacy of the ESP block, I think it's entirely justified that recent guidelines from the Prospect Group and the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists all recommend the ESP block as a perfectly good alternative to paravertebrals and epidurals in both thoracotomy and VATS. Note, however, that they make specific mention of continuous blockade regardless of the technique, which again highlights the importance of matching block duration to pain trajectory. I'm here to be useful and not just to engage in debate. 
So let me end with a couple of suggestions on how you can optimize your ESP block for efficacy. As I said at the beginning, this is a block by proxy, and the goal is to promote local anesthetic spread to the neural targets of interest. In thoracic surgery, these are the ventral rhema and intercostal nerves. And the pathways where the spread exist, and local anesthetic travels there through a combination of bulk flow and diffusion. The first thing, therefore, is to ensure that you're injecting in the right place. There are two flavors or versions of ESP blocks, depending on whether you're interested in analgesia of the anterolateral torso or the posterior torso. In thoracic surgery, we're interested in getting our local anesthetic to the ventral rami, not the dorsal rami. And this means injecting under the fascia of erector spinae muscle, not within the muscle. The best way to ensure this is to aim to place your needle tip between transverse processes, not on them. Landing on the transverse process can often hinder your ability to get the needle bevel under the fascia, which may be tightly adherent to the bone. I refer you to a nice cadaveric study by Monica Harbell, which also describes this well. The second thing to consider is the volume and speed of injection both of which will influence the bulk flow and spread of local anesthetic. There is evidence that 30 milliliters rather than 20 milliliters may result in better local anesthetic spread and clinical efficacy. This also has implications for the optimal infusion regimen with continuous ESP catheters. Program intermittent bolus or PIB regimens appear to work better than continuous infusions for fascial plane blocks in general, based on the most recent meta-analyses. And this has been shown to be true specifically for ESP catheters, both in terms of clinical analgesia and the area of detectable cutaneous sensory loss. There's even some merit to combining PIB and continuous infusions. In this Belgian study, a combination regimen for ESP catheters in VATs with generous dosing produced analgesia that was none inferior when compared to a continuous thoracic epidural infusion of local anesthetic plus opioid. Now, if you don't have access to a PIB-capable pump, then running a higher continuous infusion rate is what I would recommend. Looking at the two studies I discussed earlier that compared ESP to paravertebrals, the positive study by Murthy and colleagues, the Irish study, used an infusion rate of 10 to 15 milliliters per hour, whereas the negative study by Andrade Filo and colleagues used a rate of 6 to 8 mils per hour. And this might be one factor explaining the opposite conclusions they reached on how well the ESP block works. Let me end my side of this debate by echoing the very sensible points raised by Drs. Amit Pawa and Lei White, both of whom I have the greatest respect for, as thoughtful clinical experts and teachers. Is the ESP block the best option, the gold standard for analgesic efficacy in thoracic surgery? No, it isn't. And it can't be based on the anatomy and where we're placing our local anesthetic. But that's very different from saying it's not useful and has no value. I think that is unjustified, particularly in the face of the existing evidence and the clinical experience of hundreds of practitioners and thousands of patients. I'll leave you with this thought. Whenever we're confronting a complex issue or decision, a natural instinct is to substitute an easy question for a hard one. Sometimes it's a helpful heuristic, but sometimes it isn't. I encourage you to always embrace the hard question when you're caring for that patient who's entrusted themselves to you, and to choose your answer accordingly. Sometimes the ESP block is going to be the preferred choice, given the unique set of circumstances you find yourself in, and you shouldn't let anyone make you feel bad about that. <laughs>